Stewart. Wow, hey, Turlock folks. I had the best dinner last night in the world at uh, Via Napoli. Anybody know that restaurant? So good. You guys are so lucky. There's a couple of things I want to say. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at everything. And what I'm going to do is appraise for replacement cost. So now I'm going to take this out. So what is replacement cost? So replacement cost is more like retail. So it's what you would insure things for. And then fair market value is um, more like what you'd sell things for. So it's going to be a little bit more exciting because replacement cost is always higher. So that's, that's good. Good. So um, I'd like to ask everybody, so I just finished um, my PhD and my dissertation was on a typology of collectors. And I got into who collects and why. And so, um, not necessarily that you're collectors, but I want a show of hands. So who amongst us here are stuff people? <laughs> stuff people? We had stuff people? That doesn't necessarily mean that you collect any one particular thing but that you like stuff, right? So who is married to a stuff person? Okay. Okay. Okay, so those of you that, that are married to stuff people, you don't have to actually raise your hand if you're with that person. <laughs> but I want to know how many times you've thrown away stuff of the stuff person? <laughs> Have you thrown anything away of your husband or wife's? No? You guys are all lying. <laughs> so I've got a couple of friends in the audience. There's a couple. This lovely couple actually did something that I would urge you all to do. Keep my card because after the lecture last year, they emailed me a picture of a ring they found while they were metal detecting in Virginia. And so it turns out to be a very rare Benin bronze African ring. Wow. Yeah, and we don't know how old it is. So if you've got questions that, oh, you know, Elizabeth said something and I want to know more about something I have and I didn't bring it, email me and send me a picture. There's no charge for that. And what we'll do is, I think we're going to start with um, glass. Should we start with glass or porcelain? What is that? What do you What do you think? Glass or porcelain? Glass. Okay, we'll start with glass. Okay, so so when we say glass, we're going to do everything on the table that's glass, and that way there we're going to do a little bit compare and contrast to the types of glass. So um, so we have the following is glass, right? So this is glass. These, this is glass, this is glass. Glass here. What else? Uh, this anchor hocking is glass. Is there anything I'm missing? Okay. So, first of all, we'll start off with this uh, purple vase because this is the most elemental of all the glass up there. And when I say elemental, I mean this is the one that's actually blown. So how do you blow glass? Have, has anybody seen how you blow glass? Yeah, yeah. So there's a big furnace and there's a guy who's taking the long ponte. And the ponte, uh, you know, is this long rod and you can actually blow through it. And they're, they're blowing the glass and they're turning the glass at the same time. So blowing it and turning it. When you have that, you have a piece of blown glass that's what we call free blown. So it's blown and what you get is you get a shape, which you know, you're working with because you're doing the pontal like this. So you get a round shape. Now when the, when the glass is your shape, the shape you want, it's still attached to the pontal, which is that long tube. So you have to snap it. And you snap it so that you have evidence here 
of the pontal mark. You see that? That's where the, the, the tube was. So that's your pontal mark. So when a thing has a pontal mark, I know it's blown. So it's blown glass. Well, how do you get this then? This is called the crimped edge. It's actually done the same way you would crimp hair. So there's a, a little bit of like, it looks like a big fork. And you crimp the edges like that. Then, very carefully, because the glass is, you know, sensitive, glass that breaks easily with heat, what happens is, how did that glass blower get a clear glass handle on that pitcher? Well, that's blown separately, and it's applied while both are still kind of hot. Now, can you imagine, you know, the, the masses amounts uh, of broken glass that had, you know, because it doesn't always work. So, what is this? This is a water pitcher or a lemonade pitcher, and Here's the, here's the trick question. So I want to see who's the smartest in the room. So as we go through the lecture, we're gonna, I'm going to ask questions. And usually I can pick out the really smart people because they answer, answer the questions. Right, but the, the, uh, if it was a lemonade set, how would we know it was a lemonade set? What? No, no, no. Not necessarily. No, it wouldn't be yellow glass. Yes! See? She's got one point already, you guys. She said there'd be glasses with it. A lemonade set always has glasses with it. So now, if it was a water pitcher for the table, it was, you know, didn't necessarily have those glasses with it. So, and the lemonade set came with four or six uh, glasses. So that might have been part of a lemonade set. It might have been a water uh, jug. The thing is, we can always date it by the design. Two things about the design date it to the late Victorian era. Okay, here's, um, maybe my smart lady will answer. The, there's two things about it that's obvious when you look at it that make it from that era. What is, what is one of those two things? The what? Okay. Ne the handle, one is the color. The color. So uh, the late Victorian era had very strident colors, and not pure colors, but muddled colors. In other words, uh, such colors as this purple and cranberry and gold and sage green. Those colors are very late Victorian colors. The other thing is the design of it that makes it Victorian. It's, she said design. The design is frilly. Now what happens after the late Victorian era? What's the next stylistic development? Huh? Well, you're absolutely right. I'm surprised that that came so quick. <laughs> now we have two people that are really smart. <laughs> the Art Deco period came after the Victorian period and what happens in the history of art and decorative arts is it goes from one to the other extreme. There's a big pendulum. So if you've got fussy, fancy, the next era is going to be very, very uh, linear and very geometric. So we go to the geometric, the Art Deco. So from the fussy, fancy to the very geometric. So um, that's late Victorian and we're going to put a value of $200 on that. So now we're going to go to the other extreme of glass and that's going to be American Brilliant Cut Glass. And this is American Brilliant Cut Glass here. So this is also blown. It's blown first. And then, has anyone seen how they cut glass? It's amazing. There's a great big wheel. There's a great big wheel. And the glass cutter will take that glass and carefully against this big wheel etch every little facet by touching the glass to that wheel. Can you believe it? So that's American Brilliant Cut Glass. Do we know the period of American Brilliant Cut Glass? Yes, we do. And that's going to be the period of what we call the robber barons, the first quarter of the 20th century. When we say that period, what was happening, uh, for example, in places like Newport, Rhode Island? 
these big mansions were being built, these massive mansions for very, very wealthy people, the Carnegies, the Mellons, the Fricks, the Vanderbilts, for example. Mrs. Vanderbilt in, what was it, it must have been 1905, commissioned an entire, when I say dining table, I mean a dining table as long as the front row, for example. She commissioned a dining table to have a set of American Brilliant Glass made for the whole service. That means the, the, the bowls, the, the plates, the serving pieces, the glasses, everything, it was an American Brilliant cut glass. And so she had, and people say to me, well, are you sure? Because you can't, really can't serve hot in cut glass. But you can if you got Mrs. Vanderbilt's money, right? <laughs> so she did, she had this whole, well, what happened then was every bride that got married from the period of 1905 to 1915 wanted to have American Brilliant cut glass on the table to be like Mrs. Vanderbilt. Oh, that's perfect, that's great, I love it, thank you. And so that's the period of American Brilliant cut glass and that particular piece is actually worth about $300. Yeah. Uh, what is the main danger of American Brilliant Cut Glass? The faucet. The faucet. Because here's the faucet, and if you look at the top, those are called dentilations. So the little things that go do 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 they look like little teeth. Those are dentilations, and they always get chipped off by the faucet. And this is in good condition, so this is a, a great piece, and three hundred uh, three hundred dollar piece. Now we're going to look at we're going to look at this. This is Anchor Hocking, and Anchor Hocking is the name of a glass company. You can see the little anchor mark on the bottom, and it's a little covered tea uh, teacup. And then there's also a little doll, a doll size here. Can we see that? Isn't that cool? A little doll size. And it is in colors that tell us exactly the period. And I'm going to go to my smart lady over here in the gold coat. It is Art Deco. So it's Art Deco because of the streamlined lines and of the strange colors, that pink and black. So Art Deco period, so we're talking the 1930s, and a little set like that, the value is about $150 for the pair. Anchor Hocking is um, very famous for making uh, refrigerator sets. When I say refrigerator sets, what do I mean? Before we had baggies and Tupperware, we had glass, yeah, 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 for storage in the refrigerator. So Anchor Hocking, that's what they did so well. Do you see this is, where this is a little um, German wine cup? Combination here of all the above. So this is blown. This is molded. When we say molded, what do we mean? We mean actually that the glass was poured into a mold. And the mold itself was, had this shape. And you can kind of see the two mold marks where the mold then came apart, you see? So it's a mold. Uh, blown and then it was also cut. So all three things in these, these are called roamers, R-O-E-H-M-E-R, -E -E and they're for uh, this German drinking glasses. Usually these were, were in a set with um, a wine, I don't know what you call it, a wine carafe usually on a stand. So the, this, these little cups say Stuttgart on them and the value of these are about $50 each. The little blue set that's coming around. Now, you look at that and you think, well, that looks to me could be bought even, you know, today. As a matter of fact, that blue set is a Civil War era. Yeah. So the blue set, that's actually what we call early pattern glass. P-A-T-T-E-R-N, pattern glass. Pattern glass was done Right after the Civil War, when we started to think, well, we could have anything we wanted on our table, because now we can do glass in molds. It was the first time we were actually, uh, we, we did mold glass, and because before it was all blown. So we developed molded glass around 1860 to 1870, and everybody went nuts, because if you could have 
a, a white wine or a water or a red wine, why not have white, red, water? Why not, why not have a banana boat? Why not have a cucumber dish? Why not have, and it went on and on. And we had this huge explosion of things that were glass. Likewise, we also had a huge explosion of things that had names. So we had patterns with names. Here's some names. Garfield drape after Garfield's uh, um, funeral. It was a pattern called Garfield drape and it was in the shape of a drape. Yuma loop. That celebrated the first connection in Yuma. And it was a little locomotive style. We had uh, the sisters, which were sisters that were actresses, performing actresses. I forget their famous names, but of the time. We had coins, we had Egyptian, we had all kinds of patterns. And so this is a pattern also, don't know the name of the pattern, but it's an early pattern from the Civil War, and in fact, they were whole sets in that pattern. Now, if this was a set of that, we'd be talking about $800, as it is, we're talking about $25 each for that. So does that cover all of our glass? So good, let's do porcelain. There's three pieces there of Chinese porcelain, okay? Actually, no, three pieces of Asian porcelain. Let's say it like that. Actually, no, that looks, wait a minute, let me see the bottom of this as well. Yeah, okay, so three, four pieces of Asian porcelain. We have one in this lady's left hand is Nippon. Nippon is the, is the word for Japan, right? Mm -hmm. Things are marked Nippon. That doesn't mean it's a factory Nippon. It means it's from, it's from Japan. And that started, uh, strangely enough, Nippon, you didn't have to mark things with country of origin. And Okay, let's see if anybody knows this one. Under which president... Did you have to, was there a law that you had to mark things with country of origin? No, not Roosevelt, McKinley. So it was the McKinley Tariff Act, and things from McKinley's era on had to be marked with country of origin. So therefore, you can date things when it says made in. If it doesn't say made in, lots of times it's earlier than McKinley, and we're talking like the last quarter of the 19th, first quarter of the 20th century. Now, I think it's really interesting because in these examples, the Nippon, the little vase, you see that little vase with the beautiful flower on it. Uh, this is an aesthetic which is very, very Asian looking in shape, but in the design, it is not. So in shape, it has an Asian aesthetic. In design, it has an actual you know, a painted surface in a very Western way. When I say Western, I don't mean like Western cowboys. I mean yeah. Eastern as opposed to Western aesthetic. So this is actually worth about $150, the Nippon. This is actually, look at this, how cool this is. This is beautiful porcelain. It is in an Asian aesthetic. In other words, the shape is Asian and it's in an Asian style paint job. But the paint job is actually in colors that are very Western. So what this, now I'll get to why this is important in a minute. This is a, a Western shape. Sugar bowl is not an Asian thing. This is in a Western shape, but it has an Asian aesthetic. When you see the mixing of two aesthetics, Western and Eastern, what you see is you see that the trade routes are now, they've been opened. So, you know, Commodore Perry opened up Japan in 1857, and then Japan kind of shut down again. Well, the Canton really didn't open for trade, Canton being in China, didn't open for trade till the 18th century. So what you get is you get an aesthetic that is a little bit European and a little bit Chinese or Japanese. And you get them combined kind of fighting for each other for a while. And this is exactly what's going on here. Until you get to about eight, 1920 to 1930. And what you get here is made in Japan. But look, what is that? That is such an English, that's English blue and white. Huh? 
That's the blue willow pattern. That is as English as they come, but this is so interesting because the original blue willow was based on a Chinese fable of two lovers, right? So you get, now, when was that? That was in the 18th century. Remember I said Canton was just being opened up to trade in the 18th century. That's when Blue Willow came over to England in the first place, right? So then what happens is the growth of the Asian trade to us, to the West, and you get the re-exportation, right? So Blue Willow, China to England, and then it gets re-exported back to China so that they can sell it where? To England. <laughs> and that's what that bowl represents. Isn't that fascinating? In one little piece of object, you get a whole history. So that bowl itself is a trifle bowl. What's trifle? It's a kind of dessert, English dessert, right? So it's a trifle bowl. Let's do some values on this. Uh, $200 on this. The little teapot, I would say 75. The little covered sugar, I would say 50. The Nippon, we said 150. While we're at it, doesn't this seem rather large to you for a sugar bowl? <laughs> huh? <coughs> Let me tell you something. You can date the history of porcelain by just sugar bowls, okay? Now, let's go back to the Civil War in this country. What happened in the Civil War was our whole economy changed. Either we were agrarian or from farms, or we were from the city, right? The farmers were farmers, the mercantile class was the mercantile class. But the Civil War changed everything, and all the farm boys either died or came to the city. So you had all the men leaving the land and coming either to fight or to the cities, which meant you had the phenomenal growth of a thing called the boarding house. Now what happens at a boarding house when you have 20 men from the age of say 20 to 40 on a long table? and there's not enough protein, because where's the protein going? To the war. What happens, what do you, how do you get that energy? Sugar. The sugar bowl grows during that, those days. I've seen sugar bowls from the Civil War era that are this big. Yeah, so you see the sugar bowl changes as people's diets change, and right about this time, when we see this sugar bowl being this big, I can date that by just the size of that sugar bowl. So right there, that sugar bowl is telling me 1890. You see? Isn't that interesting? Okay, so let's see. That's a, we did porcelain. There's a couple more pieces, if I have my two helpers here. So there's, there's this, this, there's that white uh, jug, and then... Um, and I, while they're doing that, I'm going to talk about this piece because this piece is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And if I could steal one piece today, there's always something I want to steal. <laughs> this would be it. This is fantastic. Look at that. Now, okay, me, I've got two smart people so far. Let's see if I have any other smart people. What is this? No. So, a chore girl? A what? Chore boy or chore girl? From doing so dishes? Oh, oh, like, you know, yeah, for, from your, um, yeah, yeah, to hold like a Brillo pad or such a thing. Paperweight. No. Paperweight? No, paperweight, no. No, not jewelry. Not spittoon. Well, first of all, what is it? What, it, what is it meant to look like? Yeah, a grotesque, right? So this is a grotesque mask. And, um, where, if you were a piece of architecture, where would you see this? Would this be a classical feature? Where do you think this design feature heralds from? Yes, up high, yeah. Okay, I'll tell you. I gave you the hint when I said classic. Is it a classic element? It is in fact a Roman element or a Greek element. When I say classic, I mean classic. 
That's a classic element. In fact, you know who this is, right? What's the first origination of the devil in the Greek mythology? Pan. He's Pan. See? His little horns, he's a little Pan. He's a little devilish trickster, isn't he? He's little Pan. Now, he's a little grotesquery Pan, but he's also in the shape of a classical thing. I bet you guys will never get this. He's a lamp. He's a lamp. He's a lamp. You know, it's so funny how electrified we all are. So do you know what early lamps were? They were nothing more than a shape like that that held oil, where you float a wick in the oil, and you burn the lamp that way. In Alaska? In Alaska, maybe, too. So you burn the lamp, you put the oil in the lamp, you put the wick in there, and you burn the, you burn the wick, right? He's an ancient form of a lamp in the shape of pan. He's fantastic. Believe me, it's a lamp. Now, this is made by Rookwood. Rookwood has got the two R's facing opposite directions as a stamp on the bottom. And Rookwood comes out of Ohio. It's an early art pottery, fantastic pottery. And this piece is worth $800. Rookwood is valuable. And the fact that it's a lamp. Now, what have we been using this for at home? Whose is this? Who? What have you been using this for? I thought it was an ashtray. An ashtray. <laughs> It's an $800 ashtray. <laughs> okay, so let me get my helpers here again, and let's do... Um, this is a piece of porcelain, and this is a piece of porcelain here, and this is a piece of porcelain there. Yeah, and this, do we do this? Blue and white? That's a piece of porcelain. And then there's a couple others. That those porcelain things and that white pitcher we can do when we get back. Yeah, you did the white. Okay, then I should talk about that while you bring that around. Okay, here we have a, 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 just a white pitcher. Now, what was this used for? It was used for milk on the table, and likewise, um, milk and sugar as well. The, the, the pitchers were big for milk as well, and this this was a little milk pitcher for the table. And by the shape, I can date it to also uh, the last quarter of the 19th century, the first quarter of the 20th century. And when I say by the shape, it has a shape. Okay, you said Art Deco. This is a very sister um, decorative, uh, um, decorative era. Who knows? It starts with Art. art Nouveau. Nouveau, my smart lady. Two points. You got two <laughs> points now. It's Art Nouveau shape. Art Nouveau shape. How do we say, what, what characterizes Art Nouveau shape? Art Nouveau shape, remember Art Deco, Art Deco, straight line, straight geometry. Art Nouveau, organic, curvy, organic, au natural, loopy, not straight, feminine. That's Art Deco. Made famous by people like Tiffany. Louis Comfort Tiffany in the famous Art Deco style jewelry and the windows that he did. Okay, so let's talk about, the, everybody saw these, let's talk about this figure. This is a figure called Bisque. Bisque is porcelain that has been fired, but it hasn't been fired to the extreme heat that porcelain is fired to. This is porcelain here. This is porcelain right here. This is Bisque. This was fired to 2,000 degrees. This was not. And you see, with porcelain, you glaze it, and it's white through the glaze. With bisque, it's white, but it also is uh, porous enough that it can accept painting right on the bisque. Do you see what I'm saying? Not glazed, can accept painting right on the bisque. So this is bisque, and usually bisque comes from Germany. Bisque is a really un 
uh, uh, underappreciated kind of porcelain because it really, people always thought it was the poor man's porcelain and it was kind of um, middle class. If you had enough money, you bought porcelain. If you didn't have enough money, you bought the bisque. Now porcelain, this is a set, Bavarian set of uh, porcelain. It's a beautiful shape and a beautiful design and a whole set of this is probably worth $50. Can you believe it? And I'll tell you why. <laughs> Serious. How many of you have kids or grandkids and how many of you have tried to give them your formal dinner service? <laughs> what happened? They, they didn't want it. They didn't want it. Can you believe it? My son, my son, can you imagine the good porcelain that I must have? Doesn't want it. Mom, it'll sit in the closet. I said, well, okay, you don't want the Thanksgiving set? No, that'll sit in the closet. How about the formal service for, for Christmas? You know, the spode, for Christmas spode. How about that? Mom, that's disgusting. It'll sit in the closet. I said, what about the sterling silver flatware from your great-grandmother from the eight, you know, 1800? We don't want it. Why? Can't put it in the dishwasher, Mom. <laughs> so that means all formal dinner services are worth about $50 in this market today. They're not worth anything. It, the, the market doesn't want them. The kids don't want them. They're not worth anything. It's really sad. But my prediction is eventually they're going to be worth something again. So you could hang on to them. But for now, you can't hardly even give them away. Yeah. So that's the sad news. So the bisque figure is worth about uh, $75. The porcelain is worth hardly any, hardly, no, nothing. And then we had also this little piece. So this is a little English piece, and it's mason. I can see on the back the... The, 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 it's called the registry mark and for a, a short time in English porcelain and um, ceramics there was a registry mark instead of an actual stamp on the back. What is that? What, where did you put that at the table? Huh? Pickles? No, it's not pickles. Butter. Not butter? Candy. Not candy. Huh? Bread. Not bread? Candy. Not candy. Who said bones? Three smart people in this audience. Okay, bones. This is a little bone dish. Well, the, uh, it's kind of small. <laughs> you got your big bone. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it's your bone dish. It's for your chicken bone. It's for the bone in the, you know, the ribeye or whatever that bone. It's, it's a bone dish. You put that in those little, and they went in front of the plate. So if you're sitting here, right, and here's your main plate, your bone dish is there, or sometimes here. Sometimes they're curved a little bit, but they're always that, that size. So that's a little bone dish. That is worth about, mm, I would say about $40, that dish. Let's see, what other? Oh, and then this, this is a really special little piece. I don't know, did everybody see this little tiny piece yeah. as it was going around? I hope you did. Because I hope you really saw the detail. So the little terrier really looks like a little terrier. The little um, sweet meat that he's feeding the dog is 100%. He's just gorgeous and his little face is gorgeous and you can see each little eye and each little pupil. And his hair is beautiful and his cape is gorgeous. And there's the cross swords on the bottom. What are, cr who, who is the maker when you see those cross swords? Mycin. So it's mycin. Mycin is an important thing. So let's go back to the 18th century. Mid 18th century, there's a mad King Ludwig, and he lives in a palace called Neuschwanstein. And mad King Ludwig is pissed off royally <laughs> because. People are coming to him from the courts of Canton in China with this wonderful thing that is so strong but so delicate you can see through it and it's called porcelain. 
and we don't know the secret of the chemicals that make up porcelain. And so the Mad King said, he was mad too. Mad King says, I will pay blah Deutschmarks to the person who can develop the chemicals that make porcelain. And so the fight was on. All the chemists in Germany in the mid 18th century were scrambling to find out what the composition of porcelain was. Now, in the town of Meissen, a chemist discovered it. A chemist was named Bochler, B O E C H L E R, and Dr. Bochler said, I got it. We're missing one thing, and that's kaolin. Kaolin is similar to the chemical nature of the human bone. And so the answer is, why is this called bone china? That's why, truly. So he developed the chemical uh, composition and the first porcelain house in the European world was born and it was Meissen, called Meissen. Cross sword for the mad King Ludwig and Ludwig had he wouldn't let the factory go anywhere else but in his <coughs> palace. And so he set up the uh, factory right there in his palace. Now what happens if you're living on top of a chemical reaction <laughs> that involves you know, almost nuclear fission at the time of over 2,000 uh, Fahrenheit kilns? And every so <coughs> often, because it's in its infancy, every so often, the whole damn thing blows up. So you wonder why he was mad? That's the reason. What was the value on the license? Uh, $900. Yes, I will. Now you're saying, $900? Why? Okay, I'll tell you why. Remember we talked about Mrs. Vanderbilt and her table service, right? So Mrs. Vanderbilt commissioned American Brilliant Glass Blowers to make a thousand plus pieces for her dining service. Now, where you showed your money and your class was at the dining table. Do you know something? My son doesn't even have a dining table. <laughs> they are also passe. Have you tried to give your son or daughter your dining set? Your tables and chairs, like eight tables and chairs? Do they want it? No, they don't want it. Dining, you can't, can't give them away, but Mrs. Vanderbilt, let's go back to her. At least she had the good sense to have huge dining service. And at each place setting, she could put a little favor. And so her centerpiece would have a theme, and the centerpiece may have a theme like uh, 18th century uh, court and uh, nobility. And so the centerpiece would have a candelabra. And the candelabra would have, for example, a woman, it would be in porcelain, the candelabra. The candelabra would have a woman, and the woman would be in beautiful uh, court dress, and there would be a little cupid in an apple tree and the cupid would be handing her down an apple and this would all be in the candelabra. You get the picture? And here would be your candelabra. Now that would be your two <laughs> candelabra but also part of that set, that centerpiece, would be little figurines that had to do with that court life. And so there'd be little figurines all in the centerpiece and then at each person's place there'd also be a little figurine. It would all be themed to those candelabra. Sometimes the candelabra would be beautiful, buxom shepherdesses and shepherds, you know, in the field looking like Marie Antoinette, and then the whole table would be themed that way. Or you, you get the picture. So that little Meissen figure is a little court scene, and he would have been at the top of the table setting for each person, one like him. And um, when you say, well, what makes it $900? It's because it's 18th century and because he's in perfect shape, because there isn't anything wrong with him, no cracks, no nothing. So let's talk about silver. Let me see the bread dish, darling. 
Okay, so this is quadruple plate. What's plate? Ah, that's right. So there's base metal. Sometimes the base metal is copper. Sometimes the base metal is nickel. But it's base metal. Over the base metal is electroplated silver. How is that done? Does anybody know? So the metal is sprayed with a certain chemical. That chemical, uh, when it's put into a bath of silver, the bath of silver doesn't have to be hot, but when it's put into a bath of silver, the molecules of silver adhere to the base metal. So this was a technique that was developed in 1860 in the United States. When it happened, everybody and his brother and his brother's mother-in-law had silver plate. Now, here's the bad news. How many of you had moms that got silver plate for wedding present? And you have so much silver plate, you don't know what to do with it. This is my mother. What do you do with silver plate? First of all, you got to polish it. And it's not worth much. Now, you can't give it away these days. This is earlier than that, though. This is, the, this is 1870 or so, and it's dated 1878 to 1903. So I would say it was somebody's commemorating a marriage or something like that. And so it's a little bread plate, silver plate. Um, this is worth about, I would say, 75 to 100 dollars. This is marked uh, 1888 Rogers and Co. Now, I think I get asked two questions the most in my career as an appraiser. Number one is, uh, I pick up the phone and the voice on the end of the phone says, now I have a brown dresser. And there's some, I'm supposed to guess, you know? <laughs> That's one. The other one that I get asked is, I have a set of silver pa um, that was made in 1881. I get asked that all the time, what is it? Well, here's the news. Roger Silver, the name of the company, was 1881 Rogers. That's the name of the company. So, I always get asked that. So it's the name of the company, but it, this is not silver from 1881. In fact, this is what we call coin silver. Now let me take it, so we looked at electroplate, silver plate. There's, um, let's look at coin silver and look at sterling. Here's sterling. Sterling, if you think of a fraction, let's think of a thousand over a thousand. If you think of sterling, sterling is 925 parts silver over a thousand base metal. Base metal, what's base metal? It can be nickel, copper, it can be an amalgam of those. So 925 parts silver over a thousand. What's coin silver? It's a little less silver. It's 800 silver over a thousand. So not everything that's called silver is sterling. Sterling is only the fraction 8925 over a thousand. Coin silver is 800 over a thousand. Coin silver is called coin silver because during the war time, if you wanted a silver service, you'd have it melted down from your coins. And the coins were not made in sterling. They were not 925 over a, th a thousand. So what this lady has is coin silver, and coin silver is not quite as valuable as sterling usually because the silver content isn't there. But it is still valuable, and it's still in a box set, and a gorgeous little set, and in a really interesting classical design, like we were looking at the pan there, this is a design on the, on the sterling, which you can come and take a look. It's called the Greek key. What's a Greek key? It's an element that's on the top, the frieze, the top friezes of beautiful Grecian architecture, and it's, it has a resurgence in the 1880s. Why does it have a resurgence in the 1880s through the 1920s? What was going on? Anybody? Okay, I'll tell you. We were rediscovering the ruins of Troy, like Schliermann was the professor that was discovering that. We were discovering the rules of Herculaneum. We were discovering Vesuvius ruins. We were discovering in the 1919, 19, 19, yeah, 1919, 1920, King Tut's tomb, right? So 
all things classical were everybody was crazy with that and so there was the classical design on many things this set included sets going to be worth eight hundred dollars this beautiful little set oh and then this is an interesting thing so I, I love it. My mom and dad are both from Germany, and I always like to make fun of the German everything because of that. And this is German. And this is sort of like one of those things, which is, this is German inventiveness at its best. <laughs> because this is actual silver, which is a, a paint, paint that has sterling. It's actually sterling. So if you polish this, it would polish silver. It isn't silver, it's porcelain, but it's a paint that the Germans invented that looks like silver, and if it was polished, it would look like silver. And then the rest of it is ceramic. So this is um, a type of, yeah, if you polished it, it would come up very, very bright. So there's a part of it that's silver. The problem with this is, I'm surprised this lasted this long. What happens when you heat silver. It conducts, right, very quickly. It conducts heat. As a matter of fact, I think Christy can tell you, last time I was here, I was making fun of um, techniques to piss off your girlfriends. And if you, um, if you are served at your girlfriend's house and she's not serving you with her sterling, and you don't really have your reading glasses on and you can't look to see, all you have to do is this. Because if it warms up really fast, it's sterling. If it doesn't warm up really fast, it's not sterling because silver plate won't conduct heat as quickly as sterling. Sterling conducts heat really fast. So right away you're like, oh, okay, you're off the hook. You serve me with your sterling, you're fine. <laughs> When you have hot coffee and you have a handle that's been silver plated, <laughs> so anyway, that's a little just a poking fun at my heritage. Uh, we did all the sterling, so let's do let's do the two lamps. Those that should be fun. Let's do the two lamps. How much is that base worth? The sterling pitcher that's probably worth about seventy five. Yeah, thank you. Here we have two really good examples of the history of the electric light bulb. This particular lamp started life as an oil lamp. That is not an electric lamp. That's an old oil lamp. It's, as a matter of fact, an astragal lamp, which means it was made to glow with whale oil. And it was meant to have a wick, and it was meant to have a flue, and it was meant to have a shade on top of that. That's right. This is an oil lamp. Now what happens then is uh, Edison comes along and in 1873 Edison says I'm going to electrify one building and show everybody how fantastic my electric light bulbs are. What one building did he electrify? Anybody know? I'll tell you the Hotel Del Coronado in San Diego. He electrified that building, people came to see it, and they thought, holy Lord, I am going to run out and turn my oil lamps and everything else I get my hands onto into a receptacle for a light bulb, because I'm gonna show off. And so people took any anything in sight, vases, existing oil lamps, pieces of fountains, they took anything and they electrified them. And sometimes the best antiques I find are old Ming vases, for example, that somebody's electrified. And when I say electrified, means put a cord somewhere. Luckily, this person got smart and didn't put a cord right up through the middle, which is typically what happens. I take the Ming vase, they say, eh, it's only a 15th century in, in, irreplaceable piece of porcelain. Let's just take a drill and drill through the whole middle. And so, you know, 
that's what happened. And so you had these incredible vases that got drilled. And so I find some incredible finds that way. You know, that's what happened. My grandmother, I can remember, she never liked to turn a light bulb on, so her house was constantly dark. So when I was little, she had the original Edison bulb still. And I remember looking up at her chandelier, I said, Grandmother, why don't you put a shade on those, you know? She says, oh no, I gotta show them off. She was still in that mindset. She still wanted to show off those bulbs. So the value on that is pretty good because nobody's drilled through the center of it. So the value on that, mm, let's say 400 on the astrogal lamp with a beautiful uh, cut glass cranberry, um, I guess you would say container for the oil. And then this lamp, can you imagine this? Look at that thing. Shall I hold it up? I'll try. This thing looks like it could kill you. Look at that. It's so, it's so bad, it's cool. It's really cool. It, it's, it's supposed to be a fountain, and then the, the things that are kind of falling over there, supposed to be sort of like the water coming up. And instead, you know, the, uh, and the lady told me, the crystals here are not the original crystals. The original crystals are um, also the same kind of light gold as the glass in the middle. But you know, for the glass in the middle, what are you supposed to do with that? You're supposed to put flowers in there. Now what happens? <laughs> what happens when you drill through the center of a fountain and then you put water on top of the electric? What happens? So, so this is just to illustrate to you what was going on when people were looking for things that they could turn into lamps. They would electrocute their mother-in-law <laughs> over the pride of having a light bulb show. Uh, we got two clocks. Let's do two clocks. Uh, ladies, I don't think you want to carry those around. So we will do these two clocks. Yeah, I think about 100 to, 100 to 200, yeah. It's very interesting, but, okay. Do you know when the cranberry one was made? This is 1850. Yeah. Two clocks. Uh, one is uh, pendulum, right? So there's a pendulum. Here's where the weights are adjusted. Up through here, you can see the little shortening. You can shorten the, the um, tension. Then we have this clock. Now, we are so used to looking at this sort of clock that we forget where it comes from. So what this is is classic design. When I say classic, remember I'm saying classic in the sense of Greek and Roman. This looks like a little Greek sarcophagus. This is very, very classic, classical, very straight, very angular, very geometric very dark, very dark. Now, this was, this went, okay, I'll ask you this. What part of the house and where would you see? On the mantelpiece. On the mantelpiece. Without a doubt. Why? Who made that rule? Who said clocks had to be on a mantelpiece? We all assumed that that was the way it went, right? Okay, I'll tell you why. This would have been given as a gift, and it would have been given with two other pieces. Those two other pieces are called mantle garniture, and the mantle garniture was either candelabra or sometimes vases in the same color, in the same style. So this piece is actually missing its garniture, this actually pre predates this. So this is the first quarter of the 20th century, 
and this is actually the third quarter of the 19th century. So this predates, well, that predates this, I should say. Why it was the mantle was that there was a focal point in the house. This goes back to the time when we first, I think, started to come down out of trees. Uh, this was that the hearth was the center of the house. So where the center of the house was, was your, your fireplace, your mantle. The thing that um, um, was, the, was most mm, hammered into us by years and years of religion was that you only have so much time. time. And what you do with that time, you damn well better be good. Otherwise, you might go where you're not supposed to go. So you better be. So what would be the most focal point reminder of time would be your hearth, right? So the time, the, the element of time, your reminder, Tempest Fugit, was the hearth. And that's where that came to be. The clock is worth about $150. Okay, so let's go on to this clock. Okay, this is quite a nice clock. There's a little tiny round circle. In the circle, it says S T. S T. Yes. Four smart people. Seth Thomas. Clockmaker out of Newport, Connecticut, Seth Thomas, very nice clock. And um, clocks right now are not uh, worth much in, in the market. People are having trouble selling clocks. I think because, you know, and wristwatches, nobody's wearing wristwatches anymore because everybody's got their phone with them all the time. So clocks and, and timepieces are on their way declining in market value. That should be an $800 clock. Today you couldn't sell it for 800. You'd be asking maybe four for a clock like that. I always find it funny what people put. For example, the lady on the, the, the pan mask, ashtray on the little, you know, what is it kind of card that we have you all fill out. This lady says this is an Easter egg. Is that an Easter egg? Huh? What is it? Huh? No, no, no. Oh, I wish it was. Yes! Yes! It's a darning egg. Yeah! It's a darning egg. Last time I went to visit my son, right? He's got size 14 and a half shoe size. He's a big kid. So 14, so he lives in Raleigh, Durham. So go to visit my son and say, you know, you've got a special order of your socks. Let me darn them for you. He said, what are you talking about? <laughs> Do you think we want you to do stuff like that? That's crazy. Are you living in another generation? Are you nuts? Why? Throw them out. They, so what I'm trying to get at is that's an obsolete thing. A darning egg is an obsolete thing. What you do is you put it in your sock. It naturally took the right shape. It was perfect. You made a little woven design with heavy, thick darning thread, and you fixed your socks. Who darns their socks here? Anybody? You do. I know I give you the prize. A light bulb works. You know. My mind is going, let's not use the light bulb while it's on in this one, though. Okay, we're good. So, 
we're going to look at a couple of things. There's a lovely little autograph book coming around. In that autograph book, oh, let me see that autograph book for one second. Thank you. I happen to glance at this. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Remember the future. Remember the past. Remember the boy what kissed you last. <laughs> when you stand before the tub, think of me before you rub. And if the water is too hot, cool it and forget me not. <laughs> Go forth thy little volume like Noah's faithful dove and bring to darling blank an olive leaf of love okay what year? this album yeah what year it, it by looking at the design of the cover it looks like uh, yeah late 1800s 1889 is the first entry now these were treasured and obviously you see a number of these they've come down through families how the heck are we going to do that? Are we going to save? Are we going to save our Facebook pages? How are we going to do that going forward? You know? How are we going to do that? That was in a different era where the written word actually meant something special. They're not worth that much, the autograph books, unless they're celebrity. Unless they're celebrity. So this is Occupied Japan. Occupied Japan, 80, uh, 1950, 1945, 1955, just 10 years, and Occupied Japan. And when we think of that, we think of a, a worn, torn, bombed out Japan, where people are struggling to get their you know, feet back under them. And so they're taking hold of anything and making crafts with it. We used to go to the Kresge's in my farm town in Illinois, and we used to say, yeah, it's made in Japan, it's junk. You know, now it's like, oh, I want the Japanese car, right? So it's come a different way, hasn't it, right? So made in Japan. So made in Japan, this uh, uh, made in occupied Japan is worth more than made in Japan. So we're talking on this probably uh, $50 on, on that. And what else did we carry around, ladies? Oh, yes. Okay, the Josephine and Napoleon. So this is a little dessert set, Josephine and Napoleon. It's got little cups that go with it. And um, somebody needed to tell the porcelain maker, well, first of all, it's the first quarter of the 20th century when people are rediscovering French porcelain. And it's also thanks to the ladies in Newport, Rhode Island. So Limoges and Sev and all these great porcelain houses are starting to grace the tables of these ladies. So likewise, this is a service, French service, and they like to hammer it home by saying, here's Napoleon and here's Josephine. Problem was, he dumped Josephine. He couldn't stand her. <laughs> he couldn't get her out of, out of there quick enough. You know, she was older than he was, and I guess she got, you know, uh, under his skin. She didn't want to have kids. She already had kids. So he's like, fine, I divorce you. And he married, um, I don't know, somebody who was, 17, uh, Empress of, of Austria, and had a, a boy, the boy died, but he, he, he wouldn't speak to Josephine ever again. So, you know, somebody needed to tell, tell the porcelain people. But it makes for a nice little service, and that service is worth about $150. The cows that are coming around are little advertising ant antiques. So there's a category of collectibles called the advertising antiques, and people used to put their name, their business names. That is a particularly great one, because if you look at the little calf, the calf is saying, oh, I want more milk. And it's about a cream separating machine, so it's fantastic. You know, so this is a little tiny advertising memento. I think that's probably worth about $150. The little thing that's coming around is looking like scissor. Okay. The first quarter of the 20th century, there were so many things on the table, you couldn't even get the food on the table anymore. Be between the pickle, jar, the pickle container, the pickle fork, 
the banana boat, the this, the that, the other. There was so much junk on the table. And that is just one other thing that's a piece of junk on the table, although that is silver and gold, that little, uh, little scissor, right? That little scissor, there is no reason for that to exist. None at all. Why? What does it do? It cuts the top of the egg off <laughs> of a hard look. <laughs> Soft boiled. Yeah. So. I have one, but I didn't see that one. And you use it every day, right? I swear to God, no, this is f to cut the top of a soft boiled egg. And you can dip your toes. You could do that. And it is silver with gold, and it is missing a ruby on one eye. You'll see. There's a hole, and it's missing a, a precious stone. What happens when you put sterling? in egg yolk. It goes black. How does the egg taste? Not, it's not, not only do you not need that, but you couldn't eat it after you used it. So it was one of those things that's just a status thing. It's just a beautiful thing. The way it works, the workmanship, the jewel factor of it, the artistry of it, beautiful. That thing for the silver content alone is $400 piece though. Yeah. So, can you all see this? This is a little toy bank where the dog jumps up and, um, you know, so the, we had, we had uh, John, John is our, our production manager for our office. And he produced um, for our office the great comedian who just passed away a couple years ago, Jonathan Winters. He lived outside of uh, San Barbara and Montecito. And we did his estate sale, which he had so many things. We had to rent the convention center to do his sale. And um, what was I getting at? Oh, yeah. So Jonathan Winters had a lot of these. He had a lot of toys, a lot of, a lot, a lot of toys. <laughs> he had a lot of cast iron and uh, iron toys, a lot of airplanes and trucks and banks. He had a whole wall full of these banks. And there's a lot of reproductions out there because there was a fad for him. This one is the real thing, and he's worth about 400. Um, this is a phenomenal. So this is a little children's card set, and it's got instructions, and each little um, deck has a different type of game with different types of instructions. How many of your kids or grandkids would have that in 50 million pieces ripped to shreds in about five minutes? What happened? The, it, look, look how perfect it is. It is so perfect. It's going to be 1920s, 1930s. So perfect. Okay, with toys and books, two things matter. Well, three things, condition, condition, and condition. And so this is in such great condition, this is probably worth to a collector $400. Because what else? How, would you ever find one in such perfect shape? Never, 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 never. Okay, so the girls are taking two paintings around. One is actually a print. So the ship is a print. It's a very famous print. It's called the Ghost Ship. And there was always, it's a, it's a myth that there's a ship that runs around and there's, you know, it's run by ghosts. And so that's the Ghost Ship. The frame is fantastic. The print is not worth that much, but the frame is very cool. So that's about mm, $300. The, the icon is fantastic. So it's an icon that's on stucco. And um, it looks like it was a part of an architectural something. So it's part of something. You see, it's from like a wall or something. This picture to go to Dave and Janet. So uh, Russian icon, and it looks like it was pulled down from a wall. Russian icons are worth a ton of money, especially the ones that are done on wood. 
So they're gesso over wood and then painted over that. And so it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So, so it looks like it's pulled off of something. In other words, it's an architectural something. So it was mounted somewhere. So it's on wood and then it's uh, gessoed over. And so it looks like it was part of an altar of some kind. Because the icons I know that, that are meant to be traveling icons are about this big. What? Well, come up closer, can you? Oh, no, you can't. Okay. The icons that I know of are meant to be traveling icons. They're small. When they get this large, they were architectural features. So it makes it even rarer. Okay? So it's even rarer. So I think I'm, I'm going to put 1,200 on that piece. Uh, okay, so some paintings. This is not a painting. This is a print. And this is a G clay. In other words, it's meant to look like a painting, but in fact, it's a photomechanical process where it's been shot by a mainframe computer, mm -hmm. even as, as it is, it's 1960s, uh, but it was, it's a print. And it's meant to look for all the world like a painting, but it's not. It's a print. So it's fr the fancy term is G. Clay. This is a nice piece. Um, I don't think it's, it's extremely well painted, but it's nice, it's pretty. And um, the value on this, I think, is probably 300. And I really like these two things. I really like these two right here. I like them very much. And I think, could is this going to be maybe, maybe the small, here, can you take this one? And maybe, is that too heavy? I don't know. See if that's. No, I got it. You got it? Yeah. Okay, I want you guys to take a look at these two. These are really nice. Now, I did a cheat, now see so I'm going to reach. This is my filing cabinet. Not much else is in there, so might as well use it. Uh, so so uh, I looked up this artist. This is a little uh, Swedish, well, actually, he's a German artist, Karl Kaiser Eichberg, and he's 1873 to 1964. And I really like that piece. I like it. It's a colorist piece, and it has a lot of uh, sort of modernist features to it. And I will put that piece, that's a, the artist was coming up uh, uh, valued at about 600 pounds, uh, Euro. 600 euros. Okay, so what do we have that now? What's 600 euros? About a thousand dollars. Yeah, and I really like this. Now you might ask, what the heck is going on here? Put it down. You're going to exhaust yourself. Okay. You're okay. Yep. What's going on here? So there's these four pretty girls. They're mending. There's expensive clothes hanging here. There's an expensive French chair here. They're on simple stools. There's a French mirror here, very fine. This is a very fine cabinet with glassware. And they're meant to be in the 19th century. So what is actually going on here? That the one girl is pointing to this handsome guy, and the handsome guy's kind of looking um, down like, Oh, don't talk about me that way, but come on, talk about me. Come on, talk about me. <laughs> what do you think's going on? Gossip. Gossip is the name of it. What's happening is, those are the servant girls in a fancy house. He's probably the, what do you call it, the horseman or the squire, or what do they call him? The chauffeur or something like that. He's got a chauffeur's cap, right? So. That one girl is probably praising him for something like, oh, you know, he's so great. And she's pointing, well, look at how fantastic he is. And he's sort of like, oh, shucks, don't talk that way about me. I think it's really cool. Now, it is in the style called genre. What's a genre piece? Genre means it's telling a story of the common folk. That's all it is. Famous genre pieces are coming out of Italy, France, and Germany. In Germany, it's the fat uh, monks or friars in the brown. And what are they doing? They're breaking into the wine casks and they're getting drunk. That's the German genre. Or the German genre style is the old guy with the big old beard and he's smoking a pipe 
and his face is all craggy? That's the German genre. Here's the Italian genre. Busty, beautiful Italian girl in a really tight, you know, one of those girdle things, flowing skirt, and her suitor is the fisherman, ripped to the max <laughs> with a beautiful net full of fish striding like this. That's Italian genre. What's French genre? French genre is going back to the 18th century. It's Marie Antoinette. The bigger the powdered wig, the better. The courtier next to her, you know, with the pants that end here and the white socks and the long wig. That's for, but you see what I'm saying? It's, te it's uh, a, an image that tells a story. So that print is an image that tells a story. It's a genre print. It's not worth all that much because there's a lot of those in the 19th century that tell stories like that. But I'm going to put it. I'm going to put it at $500. I would put it at $800. However, see this. See. What happens is the mat has acid. The acid bleeds into the paper, and whatever is behind here is going to have, I can see there's two pieces of wood probably, because wood bleeds even faster. So what needs to be done is it has to be reframed. The wood from the back has to come off. The mat has to be changed. And you can arrest the development of those stripes, but you can't ever get them away. You can actually bleach the paper, but I wouldn't advise it. Uh, so now we have one more thing. Did I? Everybody's got their things except. Right behind the picture. Right there. Oh yeah. Oh, in this, didn't we? We didn't talk about this. So Norman Rockwell signed this. It was in asking for information about the artist's life, and he, he. Um, which one? We didn't talk about which. Oh, okay. We will. Good. Good. Thank you for pointing that out. So um, here we have Norman Rockwell's signature, and uh, this is worth about five hundred to six hundred dollars. Nice. Very nice. Uh, we have here. A little German ashtray, a real ashtray, <laughs> a real ashtray. <laughs> and it's a little fox, and it says made in Germany on it. Made in Germany here again. Remember I said dates it? Remember with the McKinley Tariff Act? Uh, I like that. I think it's that's... over 100 years old. Yeah, it looks to be. So um, uh, uh, I think probably $100 on this little piece. Okay, this yeah. is soapstone. This is Asian soapstone, and it's beautifully carved. Uh, it is one of a pair. It's probably missing its mate. And in the Asian style, is it, is it soapstone? Ah! Ex oh, Exposition San Diego, California, 1916. Okay. So, um... I was wrong. Not soapstone. I, I spoke too soon. I didn't look too carefully. Jadeite. So not jade, but jadeite. So this is a little jadeite vase on, on a self-made stand. In other words, the stand is also jadeite. And um, I think I'm going to put this five to six hundred. Jadeite is quite valuable. Um, now let's talk about this. This is tramp art. Uh, you know, one of my girls can carry this around and where's my other one? Oh, she had to go? Okay. Let's see. I want you to, thank you, Christy. Can you carry so people can see this? Sure. That, the sign. Well, this lady, so this belongs to this lady and this lady in the yellow and I said I said, uh, God, that's fantastic. That's my favorite piece. And um, that talks to me straight out of Minnesota. And she looked at me. Wow, you're a psychic. <laughs> it's tramp art, which means it's called from 
cigar boxes, old crates, etc. What now you've got on the bottom cigar boxes. You can read that. It says cigar. Inside that it says dry goods, blah blah blah, Minnesota. So uh, let me just close on this remark before I tell you what it's worth because it's kind of cool. I want to just mention that um, I do have, I just wrote a book and if you're interested it's, a, it's stuff that I get asked a lot and um, it's called Generosity of Eye, um, the importance of antique maps, the problem with scrimshaw, glass collecting. Uh, rustic American furniture. It's about 50 different small answers. I have this book, which we sell for $30, but we have these CDs, which have the book on them. And that means you can blow it up as big as you want the type to be. And we sell these for 10. So if you're interested or you think somebody in your family would be interested in what I have to say about stuff, there it is. You have my card. You can email me with any questions, and if you th think, oh, I really like a book, after you leave here, you email me, we'll send you one. So we're going to tell you about the tramp art. So tramp art is an American thing. It was done by people in jail or people that were truly tramps, you know, and um, there'd be little craft houses where there'd be uh, people, kind people, that would bring these people in off the streets or straight from the jails and teach them how to do this type of art. And a collector of Americana would pay you $3,000 for that. That little box. And yes, I'm a psychic on top of it. No, I'm not. But this is, it's been a lot of fun and I always love to come to Turlock. It's always so friendly and welcoming. And now we have a drawing, I guess. We're going to draw for prizes? Yeah. Okay. Thank you.